everybody, welcome to Educating. My name is Sarah. We're so happy that you guys could join us this morning and we are going to be talking all about food webs. Food webs help us better understand how energy moves throughout an ecosystem or an environment. And energy is something that we all need in our day to day lives. So when we get out of bed in the morning, when we brush our teeth, when we play all day, we need energy to be able to do those things and we get the energy we need from our food because we're animals. All animals get their energy from their food. But what about organisms that aren't animals? So we actually rely on some organisms to help us not create energy, but to get energy from other places and turn it into energy that we can use. So this super incredible organism that does that are plants and they use their superpower, which we call photosynthesis, and they use that photosynthesis to change energy from the sun into energy that the plants can use for themselves. And then there are animals that eat plants and other animals that eat those animals and that's how energy moves throughout our environment. So when we think about how energy moves from a plant to an animal to a different animal, that is a food chain. That's one single pathway of how energy moves throughout the environment. But it's not always that easy and food chains are actually made up of a whole bunch of different building blocks or stepping stones and we call those trophic levels. So the first trophic level at the bottom of the food chain, that's going to be our plants. We call them primary producers because they're, they're not producing energy, but remember, they're taking that energy from the sun and they're turning it into energy for themselves. So they're kind of the foundation of a food chain. An example of a plant would be a flower or a little shrub with leaves on it or something like that. So after the primary producer comes the primary consumer. And the primary consumer is going to be our herbivores or our plant eating animals. So they're the very next step. They're taking that energy that the plants just created and they're eating those plants and they're turning it into energy for themselves. So those are our primary consumers and that would be an animal like a rabbit or an animal that eats plants. And then we have after our primary consumers, we have our secondary consumers. And our secondary consumers are going to be animals that are eating the primary consumers or the herbivores. So this would be like a snake. This would be like a snake who's eating that rabbit or a mouse or a different type of herbivore. So they're technically the third step in the food chain. And after the secondary consumer comes the tertiary consumer or the third consumer is what tertiary means. And those guys are going to be your higher up predators in the food chain. And those guys are going to be eating other carnivores. They're going to be eating other animal eating species. So this is going to be like a tiger or a hawk or a different type of predator that's higher up in the food chain. So you've got your primary producers over here, your plants, and then all the way over here on this end, you've got your tertiary consumers. While that might sound easy enough, environments and ecosystems are usually not that simple. So in any environment, there could be a species that has more than one different type of prey and more than one different type of predator. So if you think about that snake we talked about earlier, they might eat a rabbit and they might eat a mouse. And at the same time, they could be preyed upon by a hawk or a coyote. So now they're kind of involved in a couple different food chains. And there are also species that act as more than one step in that food chain. So we have species like omnivores that eat both plants and animals. So if you picture an animal like a bear, it's gonna be a primary consumer and a secondary consumer because they're gonna be eating berries and stuff off of the plants. That makes them a primary consumer, but they might also eat small animals and that makes them a secondary consumer. And in the food chains, we mentioned that they have those four steps and they end with tertiary consumer. But that's not always the case. Sometimes there's even more predators in the food chain. It's just not quite as common. So when we're thinking about how energy moves through an environment, there's a lot of different things that we have to consider. So sometimes we have to take a bunch of different food chains and actually put them together and combine them. And that makes a food web. And that gives us a better idea of what's actually happening in the environment. 
And then you might be thinking, so now we have all these living things that are producing energy from the sun or they're getting energy from other things that they're eating, but what about animals that have already died? What happens to the energy that they had or plants that have already died? And they kind of have their own separate type of food web. So when a plant or an animal dies, we rely on an animal called a decomposer. So this is gonna be like an earthworm or a millipede. And those decomposers will come in and they'll eat all that dead stuff up and their superpower is that they can take that dead energy and turn it back into really helpful nutrients for the soil. And that nutrients helps new plants grow and kind of starts the whole food web over again. So we really rely on those decomposers and their food web to help the living food web that we're used to seeing up on Earth. In every food web, there are tons and tons of different species. So what would happen if we removed one of those species from its environment or its food web? It's hard to actually know what would happen, but it really depends on the species. So if we removed a plant or an animal that wasn't so important in their ecosystem, it's possible that another organism would just move in and take over the role that that organism was playing. But there are some animals that are really, really important in their ecosystem. And if we took them out, the entire ecosystem would fall apart and it would, it would collapse. And we call those animals keystone species. So when we get a better idea of how energy moves through a food web or through an environment using food webs, it gives us a better idea of what exactly is going on and what animals or plants are really important for us to protect. And that helps scientists make a better plan of what we need to focus on when we're conserving an environment. So food webs help us understand how energy moves through an environment, but it's way bigger than that. So it's really important that we put together these food webs and that we think critically about them in real life. We're so glad that you guys were able to join us today and learn a little bit more about food webs and how energy flows through the environment. And we'll hope you guys join us next time. Thank you so much.